There are differences between health disparities, health inequalities, and health inequities. Health disparities simply refers to a difference in health conditions. So people who smoke are most likely, are more likely to get lung cancer. Some people are taller um, and some people are shorter. Those are disparities. And those are also inequalities. When we talk about inequities, what we're referring to is purposeful differences in health that are caused by other, by other conditions. And that distinction as to whether health inequities exist is really a moral, a moral judgment. Is it right and just that people who smoke have lung cancer? Is it right and just that migrant workers have a lower, self, lower life expectancy than the general public? Those are questions that a society has to answer. So again, the inequalities and disparities relate to differences. The inequities relate to, again, a moral judgment about those differences. The social determinants of health are, are conditions that happen out of a healthcare setting, that happen in a neighborhood where you live, where you work, where you play, that affect health. Mm -hmm. And we know that not everybody lives in environments that are necessarily supportive of health. In fact, some of the health inequalities that we have, that some of the health inequities happen um, because of a zip code and not necessarily because of a genetic code. So if we take a look at the crisis that's going on in Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. for example, that's caused by, uh, not by anything that people did or didn't do other than where they chose to live. But the lead in, in the water um, policy was a policy decision that led to this unfortunate consequence. So do we call it, you know, is it, uh, is it just that people in Flint have high levels of lead in their water as uh, compared to people in Detroit, for example, I think that's a, you know, I think the resounding answer is, is no, it's not just, and that's what an inequity um, is. Well, I think there are inequities all over the world. I think the causes of inequities are, are different. Um, they're shaped by geography, they're shaped by political history, uh, but I think the, you know, are there inequities? Sure, uh, but again, the root causes are, are different. But again, they're entrenched in history and political systems that, that manifest itself in conditions um, in which some people benefit from, uh, from their place of, of work or uh, opportunities they have versus others. I think how you address inequities are, is not just a one level, it's multifaceted. And I would say that probably the um, addressing the different dimensions may be universal, but I think the approaches are. So for example, in dealing with some of the inequities that we have, some of those are policy-related decisions, and that's where we need to address those. And I would say that that would be the same in other areas and in other systems. But mm -hmm. um, again, it's at all levels, whether it's at the neighborhood level, whether it's at the governmental level, whether it's in the educational system, but there's, um, again, where those are addressed really depends on the political, social history of that particular country or region. I think in terms of research approaches, there's been a lot more attention on looking at health in inequities and understanding um, not just that there are differences, but really trying to understand what those are. So it's looking more at um, not just genetic genetic coding, it's not looking at behavioral interventions, but really trying to understand the intersection of some of the structural issues that we have that affect behavior, that affect access to care, that ultimately affect health. So there's a lot more um, more thought giving about that. Um, it requires a higher degree of complexity, which um, we now have available to us, we're able to address because just of the mass amount of data that we have in, from different areas and different sources. So I think it's an exciting time to try and use research to address these areas in a, in a different way that we have before. Well, I uh, was interested in working with uh, the HIV-related issue among Latinos in particular because there was a, a large disparity. Um, Lat Latinos at the time of the epidemic and African Americans were the ones most affected. And when we took a look at what interventions were there available to assist those populations, there were none. So um, it was a, a 
great area uh, for us, my colleagues and I, to develop an intervention that would, ad uh, would address the cultural context and factors that we knew or that we thought would affect sexual decision making among Latino adolescents. So again, it was recognizing that there was a need, um, not uh, that there was a, a disparity, but also being aware that we could develop a solution to help eliminate that disparity. So, uh, the whole notion of community-based uh, participatory research or community-engaged research is, is the norm. I mean, the days of being able to go into a community um, study a, a problem that you think is important without community input and then expect that the that whatever you find is applicable or whatever solution that you have is um, readily acceptable by the community th those days are gone I think communities are a lot more sophisticated about research um, there have been many abuses in communities and they are more sophisticated about what they're asking for from researchers so um, there have been many leaders in this in this field who have used different approaches to engage communities in research, and I think that's uh, that's not an innovation anymore. That's absolutely a norm. I think increasing diversity in the research workforce is absolutely important for a number of different reasons. Certainly, as you're looking to do research in a particular community, um, the the idea that you have researchers that are diverse as the community that you're studying gives you a different type of credibility in the community. But importantly, if I'm as a researcher going into a community uh, that doesn't, uh, and I don't have anybody on my team that reflects that diversity, then you're thinking, well, how really dedicated are they to supporting who we are and what we are and opportunities in the long term if they don't allow people on, on the team? So it might be as a project director, but again, as as things move up, they need to, our diverse researchers need to be represented at all levels of, of research. So. I think it's important for credit for credibility, but I think it's just again a way that we we need to do business. Mm -hmm. I also think I also think that it's important to again include um, and to be inclusive of people on your research team. A it makes makes the research more credible, but it also provides different opportunities for students um, and community members to be engaged in research and to provide them with opportunities that they didn't know that. It, that they didn't know that existed. So again, we've been able, you know, if you ask somebody in the community or, you know, a student, you know, do you want to be a researcher? Most of them will say no because they've never been exposed to research. But you get them on a team and they see the excitement and they see, you know, they're part of a team and they see that the impact that being in the community has and is, I mean, it gets them inspired and jazzed in a way that, that wouldn't happen otherwise r rather than just something reading in a textbook. So again, I think it's, that type of inclusivity is, is a win-win all the way around. So creating a, an atmosphere of diversity inclusive, inclusivity is not a one-shot deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it takes a long time and solutions that you had last year may not be relevant this next year. So again, it's a constant examining of what you're doing and how that affects the population that you're serving, the workforce that you're, it, how it affects the workforce that you're serving. So again, there's multiple, multiple, to, uh, multiple ways of, of addressing this. Many people start looking at, you know, what are the attitudes that people have around their, their work environment? And that's, that's an important component. That's an important thing to be, addre to be addressed as you're look at, looking at building communities. But we also have to take a look at what are the structural barriers or issues that we place in institutions that really prevent that, that feeling of inclusivity Forward. So again, figuring out, thinking about on committees, or thinking about in a in a school, for example, who gets celebrated, who doesn't get celebrated, who can be on what committee, who can't be on what committee, who gets fed at lunch, who doesn't get fed get fed at lunch. So again, there's a lot of things that we've done out of tradition that we really don't stop to think about why why do we do that, who's in, who's out, and what effect does that have on the rest of the community. So again, there's multiple levels. Um, that we have to be uh, looking at and again making sure that we have our communities engaged in the process of trying to figure this out. It's not just my job as, as Dean, but it's us as a community to try and figure out how we build a better community. Absolutely, Absolutely I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we, we have the skills and the abilities and the will um, to build that inclusive environment. 
I think as a, a certainly as a nursing community and a nursing school, we display those behaviors all the time with our patients and, and clients that we work with and with, the, with our own families. So it's not that we're not more capable, but I think we have to have environments that make it easy to do what comes naturally to us.